Welcome back to another contract video, and in this video we're going to push a crate, a snowball, another crate, but onto a seesaw, a load of snowballs, and then we're going to bounce on a bouncy mushroom. Let's get started. So today we're looking at getting the platform and physics behavior to work together. And let's start by looking why this is so difficult. So at the moment I've got the platform and physics behavior on my player and the box has just got the physics behavior. Now, when I run this and I move to the box, you can see I drag it, but then the box teleports on top of the player's head. If I try and stand on the box in any way possible, it's just gonna jump and teleport around. We've got two behaviors that have got gravity on them on the same object. It doesn't like it, it doesn't work well. One potential fix for this, which is a fix that I added in my original video about moving boxes around, is to actually add the solid behavior to the box. Now, this allows you to stand on the box, so it gets rid of that issue. So I can now stand on the box. And I can move it around, however, it's very, very slow, unless I'm coming to it with some sort of speed, or I sort of hit on the corner, which can be a bit weird to do, and it's not very intuitive to the player. The box isn't moving very, very fast. So what we want to do today is get it so we can use both a physics and a platform behavior. And the way that we make this happen is we right click on our player, we edit the behaviors and we delete the platform behavior completely. We get rid of it and we reprogram it using the options that we get with the physics behavior. This sounds really complicated. It's not too bad. The code for this is fairly simple. So let's have a look. So we'll start with the physics behavior and how it works. The physics behavior adds gravity to an object and allows it to get pushed by other objects with the physics behavior. So the physics behavior is on my player. It also needs to be on my box. It also needs to be on my ground. Now for my ground, I've set it to be immovable. This means it does not have gravity, it does not move. So it acts as ground, but other objects can interact with it. So if our player hits the ground, it will know that that is a solid object. If it hits another object, it might bounce off it depending on the other settings. We've also got the collision box. So is it a bounding box? Which means it's using the full square box. Is it using the collision that you set up on the object or is it a circle? Circle obviously being used for round objects like our snowball. We've got this prevent rotation. So can it rotate? If it's immovable, it won't. For my player, I've said it so it can't rotate, but for my box I can, so I can knock it around, I can rotate it. We've then got the density. Think of this like a weight of the object now my object is set to 100, my box is set to 1, this means I'll be able to push my box and launch it quite far. If I set this to 10, it means that I'm not going to launch it that far, but I can shove it with quite good speed. If I set it to 100, I'm going to struggle to move it just like I did originally. We've then got friction, so how quickly do you slow when you're not moving? So again, if you're pushing an object with high friction, it's going to take a lot more effort to move it. And once we let go of moving it, how long before it comes to a stop? Elasticity is sort of bounciness. So is the object bouncy if you bounce on it or does it bounce off lots of surfaces? And then linear dampening is again, looking at how quickly it slows over time. And angular dampening is rotation speed and how quickly that slows down. Finally, we've got bullet, which seems like a bit of a weird option to have because bullets its own behavior. But all this means is have you got an object that's going to move around really, really quickly? This adds extra checks on that to make sure that object doesn't phase for a wall or anything like that. So any fast moving objects, we add the bullet behavior to as well. So I'm gonna start by adding a new object and we're just gonna start by grabbing a keyboard. We're gonna use this to move around. Now we can go to our event sheets. Now, the first thing that we need to do is set up a couple of variables. And these are going to be speed, which I'm gonna start by setting this to 15. We're then going to create a second variable and this is going to be called jump height. So how high can we jump? And I'm going to set this to 13. This is just using my map and my tests. Why I've picked these numbers. And then we want one final check. And this is going to be called on ground. And this is just going to check, can we jump? Yes or no. And by default, we'll start off as true. So these are three variables. These are variables that are normally built into the platform behavior. There's obviously extra ones as well, like acceleration, deacceleration, not going to cover today. But knowing if you want those different traits, you have to manually put them in because they're not part of the physics behavior. So now we've got these variables set up, now we need to do is do some changes to them. So we're just gonna do an event, system, and on start of layout. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our player 
and we're going to start by setting the world's gravity. So this will be the gravity of all objects, and from what I've tested around or played with, I'm going to just set mine to 20. Next, we're going to add an action, go to system, and we're going to set the value of our speed. Now this is going to take the initial value that we put in, and then we're just going to multiply it by our sprite or our player, go to physics, and then we're going to go to their density. I realize why I'm editing this, I never really explained why we're times and by density. Essentially the way that we're getting the player to move later on is applying a force in a certain direction, and the heavier an object is, the more force you need to apply to it to get it to move. So by timesing the speed by the density, if you decide to change the density of your player later on, it should still move at the same speed, because again we've done that little bit of calculation. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. We're going to repeat the same for jump height, and by doing this it just means we get more realistic numbers, instead of having to deal with numbers in the hundreds or thousands, we deal with some more numbers like 15 and 13 to control how far we jump or how fast we move. So same for jump height. Now we've done that, let's get some moving on the way. So we're going to go to our keyboard first of all, and on key pressed, we're going to start by getting our jump set up. I'm going to set mine with the up arrow, but you can set it up with whatever key you like. Next I'm going to add an action, go to my player, and I'm looking for an option called apply impulse. In terms of the X, we're not moving in the X at all, we only want to move in the Y, and we're just going to set this to minus the jump height. And that's jumping set up. In terms of movement, to get that set up, I'm going to go to keyboard, we're going to see if key is being held down, and we'll start with the left arrow key. For this, we're going to go back to our sprites, and we're going to do something called apply force this time. We're going to just do the X, and this is going to start with minus speed. We don't need to do anything with the Y because we're not moving up or down, we're just moving left and right, so we can hit done. And then we're just going to copy and paste this and just repeat for the right side. So I can click the right arrow this time, and instead of minus speed, I can just do positive speed. And we're ready to do our first test. So first of all, we can move backwards and forwards, we can also jump, and with our crate now, we can actually push it and push it against the wall, and actually it can stand on it as well. So it works like we expect it to work. You can see that I'm sometimes getting stuck a little bit on the ground. Unfortunately, I don't know what's causing this error. And again, this isn't quite new to me, so hopefully we'll find that out and get that fixed. But it doesn't happen very often. But again, we can push this crate around, which is really, really nice. Downside we've got at the moment is we don't have any limits to how often we can jump. So I can just keep jumping forever and just fly off into the sky. We want to put a fix in for that now. So first thing I'm going to do is on our key pressed for jump, we're just going to add another condition. And we're going to system, and we're going to say, is boolean set on the ground? Is the player on the ground? Have they pressed up? Then they can jump. The moment that they've jumped, what we're going to do is just go to our system, and we're going to just set the value of on the ground to false. They're no longer on the ground now they've jumped. Now we also need to make it that if they're falling, then we can still detect if they're on the ground or not. So we're going to put a simple system in place. I'm going to add an action, and we're going to check if our player is overlapping at an offset. Now all an offset does is shift our player's hitbox slightly and that way it's much easier to check if it's inside of an object or not. So we're going to do this for our ground. I'm going to shift it by 5 pixels. The more you do, the more generous this will be and allow the player to jump a little bit more easier. I found 5 worked really well for my scenario, but you might want to make this smaller or bigger. So if they are overlapping, that means they are on the ground, so we can just go to system set boolean on the ground true. Now we also need to be able to do the same the other way. So what we're going to do is we're just going to copy and paste this code and we're just going to right click and invert and then just set on ground true to on ground false. And that's it set up. However, we might have multiple objects you want to do and I want to show you a quick way so you're not having hundreds of lines of code. So I'm also going to just take this block of code here and copy and paste it again. This time I'm going to change my ground for something else, such as my block, so I might want to be able to jump off my block. And what I'm going to do is click on the far left side, so it highlights all of code 5, and then just make this an all block. Now for the opposite side, if I copy and paste this again and turn this into a block, we want to make sure this stays as an and block, so you shouldn't see any blue ores. So you can do this for all your objects. Your final option, obviously, is to actually just turn this into a family instead if you're on Construct Premium. 
So a family just allows you to add multiple objects to basically a super object. And then you can say if I'm overlapping any objects in this family, set on ground to true. If I'm not, set ground to false. So that's everything set up. There are two things that I added into here that I want to show you though, starting with the seesaw. So the seesaw, I'm able to move my sort of character to one side and it starts rotating, rotates the other way. Now currently, I can actually just push this seesaw completely out of the way and it's no longer a functioning seesaw anymore. I want to do is show you how to set this up as a proper seesaw. Now if I just back out my code and go to my layout, you'll see that I've got this little spike in the background. Now the spike's just there for show, but also we're looking at the little bit that overlaps the seesaw. That's really important because that is where we're going to attach what's called a joint. So we just need one event to get this working. So I'm going to add an event to my seesaw. I'm just going to check if it's overlapping the holder. Next, we're going to add an action and I'm just going to click on my seesaw once more. Scroll down and we're going to add something called a limited revolt joint. So what this does this is going to weld the seesaw to the spike. And this just means that it's always going to stay in place. If we don't do this, it's almost like a plank that we can knock about and put somewhere else, which might be what you need, but it doesn't work for our seesaw example. We're going to select the object we're going to attach it to, so the seesaw holder, and then the lower and upper angles. So I set mine to minus 60 and 60. And what these upper and lower bounds do is just stop it spinning a full 360. So this will be much clearer to explain when I actually show you the game running. So we've got the seesaw, if I move to the side, you'll see that it doesn't actually go right down to the bottom, it's the same for the other side. So it only rotates 60 degrees in any one angle, and if I want this to be slightly less or slightly more, I can change that. Final thing I want to show you then is just the bouncing mushrooms, and believe it or not, these don't have any code to get these to work. They just work as they are. We just need to change a couple of properties. So if we just go to any of the mushrooms and just click on them, all I've done is just put the elasticity to one and the friction really, really low. I'm not entirely sure if you need to put the friction down, I just like to put it as an extra change, but drop the elasticity to one. And then in the code, what I recommend is actually changing this five pixels to be a bit more forgiving. Now I set this to 10 in my project, I'm gonna set it up to 30 just for now, just to show you something, because I found something by just complete accident that you can actually time your jump, and if you can time it right, you can actually get a bit of a super bounce. So if we try it, there we go, we get a super bounce, and we go much higher. And then that keeps actually that jump time and we'll keep jumping that high every single time now. So these are really, really interesting. By just changing the elasticity, we get to maintain our jump height. And if we were to lower that to 0.9, it would eventually fall lower and lower and lower each time. But it's just a really, really cool, simple mechanic to add. And this is something that would take a bit more time to add into a normal platform game. But again, it's all about just timing that jump. And even with 30, it does take a bit of time to practice that jump and get that right. Now, I was just about to end off this video and I've just realized there's one more thing that I haven't showed you, which is actually slope. Slopes actually work properly now and we can slide down them and it keeps your speed. And it takes a bit of a pain to get back up them so we can actually slide down these. So this is another thing that just wasn't possible before and it's just really, really cool that we can do because slopes in a platform game are really, really tricky and really a nightmare to do. And straight away, the physics behavior, no issues, works every single time. So this project, as always, will be available in the description. So if you want to try it out for yourself, and again, it's just a bit of a tutorial that shows you how to do these different parts, just a bit of a showcase of what's possible, please check it out and try it for yourself. Like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.